In the previous video, we saw a number of classification metrics that in addition to accuracy and error, we can also look to, to optimize. And two of them were precision and recall. Now clearly we want to get both the precision and the recall as high as possible. However, this usually involves a trade-off. At some point we can only increase the precision by reducing the recall. Since we don't know in general how to balance them, since this depends on domain-specific preferences such as cost imbalance, we can visualize both objectives together in the plane. Here, each possible classifier that we might choose represents a point. The points in the corners represent our most extreme options. We can easily get a recall of one by calling everything positive, because that means that all the true positives are among the selected elements. And we can get a very likely 1.0 precision by picking the instance that we're most sure is positive, calling only that one positive and the rest negative. If we are wrong about that one, we, because then all the instances we called positive were in fact positive. In general, we want to be somewhere in between. Now, whether we prefer the left or the right green classifier, that depends on our preferences. However, whatever our preference, we always prefer either green classifier to the blue classifier, because the blue classifier is worse in both precision and recall. We can do the same with two slightly different metrics the true positive rate and the false positive rate. The true positive rate is the number of true positives divided by the actual positives, and the false positive rate is the number of false positives divided by the actual negatives. In other words, the true positive rate indicates what proportion of the actual positives we did get right, and the false positive rate indicates what proportion of the actual negatives we got wrong by labeling them as positives. The true positive rate and the false positive rate can also be placed in a two-dimensional space, and this space we call the ROC space. ROC stands for Receiver Operating Characteristic, a leftover from its invention in World War II when it was used to improve the detection of Japanese aircraft from radar signals. In these axes, we want to get as close to the top left corner as possible. We want to get the TPR as high as possible, because we want as many true positives as possible, and we want to get the false positive rate as low as possible, because we want as few false positives as possible. And again, the orange points are the extremes, and these are always easy to achieve. So far, we've thought of the false positive rate, true positive rate, the precision and the recall as a way to analyze a given set of models. What if we had a single classifier, but we could control how eager it was to call things positive? If we made it entirely timid, it would classify nothing as positive, and start in the bottom left corner. As it grew more brave, it would start classifying some things as positives, but only if it was really sure. And its true positive rate would go up. If we made it even more daring, its true positive rate would go up even further, but at the cost of getting some things wrong. So then we see the point going up, but also moving to the right a little bit. If we keep doing this, we trace out a curve, and finally we end up classifying everything as positive, which puts us in the top right corner. The true positive rate is maximal, but the false positive rate is also maximal. This curve, traced out by this classifier, gives us an indication of its performance independent of how brave or timid we make it. So how do we build such a classifier? We can achieve this by turning a regular classifier that we've seen so far into a ranking classifier, also known as a scoring classifier. A ranking classifier doesn't just provide classes for given instances, it also gives a score of how negative or how positive a point is. We can then use this to rank the points in our data set from most negative to most positive. How to do this depends on the classifier. Here's how to do it for a linear classifier. We start with a linear decision boundary, and then for every instance, we measure the distance to the decision boundary. And the further it's away from the decision boundary in the negative direction, the more negative we call it. If we then order the points in our data set according to this distance, we can then scale the eagerness of the classifier to make things positive by setting a threshold and moving it from right to left. If we set the threshold all the way to the right, all instances are classified as negative, and as we move it to the left, more and more instances are classified as positive in order of how likely our classifier thinks that they are positive. And we can visualize this in the feature space by moving the decision boundary up or down, but keeping the angle of the decision boundary the same. One drawback of ranking classifiers is that we cannot test a given ranking. 
we do not have, for the entirety of our test set, the correct ranking. We only have the correct labels. However, we can indicate for very specific pairs that they are ranked the wrong way around. For all possible pairs of different labels in our test set, we can test whether they are ranked the right way around or the wrong way around. For instance, in this ranking, T and F form a ranking error. T is ranked as more negative than F, even though T is positive and F is negative. This is what we call a ranking error. Now it's important to note that a ranking error is a pair of instances that is misclassified. So a ranking error is not a misclassification of a single instance, but of a pair of instances. And we cannot establish all ranking errors that the classifier makes. We can only establish those ranking errors that are made of pairs of different classes. We can visualize this in a table by putting all positive examples on the vertical axis and all negative examples on the horizontal axis. And in this table, and in this table every cell indicates a pair in our data set of instances with different classes. And therefore, every cell in this table is a potential ranking error. This is called a coverage matrix. And by convention, the more sure we are that a point is positive, the closer we put it to the bottom left corner, both for the negative and the positive points. We can then color a cell green if the corresponding points are ranked the right way around, and red if they are ranked the wrong way around. So red for ranking errors, and green for correctly ranked points. Note that the proportion of this table that is red is an estimate for the probability of making a ranking error on our test data. And the coverage matrix shows us exactly what happens to the true positive rate and the false positive rate if we move the threshold from the right to the left. We get exactly the kind of behavior we talked about earlier. We start with a threshold all the way on the right, which means that nothing is classified as positive, and our true positive rate and our false positive rate are both zero. If we nudge the threshold slightly to the left, the point Y is classified as positive. That means we still have a zero false positive rate because we have no false positives, and our true positive rate, and our true positive rate increases from zero to one sixth. If we move the threshold further to the left, to between F and V, we see that a large number of extra instances are classified as positive, V, Z, and X. So our true positive rate climbs to four out of six, but the price we pay is one false positive, G. So the point moves up a lot, and slightly to the right. And this trend continues as we move the threshold further to the left until the threshold is all the way to the left and we classify everything as positive, maxing out both our true positive rate and our false positive rate. A word of warning, this is an exam question. If you get this question on the exam, you will be asked to do this on a very simple data set with a very simple classifier. And the reason I mention it here is that this is something that a lot of people get wrong, and specifically the thing that a lot of people get wrong is the definition of a ranking error. So make sure that you know when you're asked how many ranking errors a particular classifier makes, what a ranking error is, and specifically, and specifically that a ranking error is not a single instance misclassified, but a pair of instances. As an example of what real ROC curves look like, here are the ROC curves for predicting gender from every single physical measurement in the ANSUR2 data used in the first lecture and in the second worksheet. And we can see that Features like buttock circumference follow the diagonal almost precisely, so they are very uninformative for gender prediction on this data set. And other features like neck circumference make almost a 90 degree angle in the top left corner, so they are very predictive for the target attribute in this data set. The red line that forms an exact, the red line that forms an exact right triangle is what we get if we use the target label as a feature. To turn this set of points into a curve, we are justified in taking the convex hull around all points. The reason for that is that if we draw a line between two classifiers we know we can create, we can also create a classifier for every point on that line simply by picking the output of one of the classifiers at random. If we pick with 50-50 probability, we end up precisely halfway between the two. And if we vary the probability, we end up somewhere along this line. Which means that if we complete the curve by joining the dots, we can look at this area as a metric for how well the classifier is doing, independent of the class imbalance. This is called the area under the curve. And note that the area under the curve and the proportion of green cells in the coverage matrix up to some details give us more or less the same value. Therefore, we can say that the AUC, the area under the curve in this ROC space, is an estimate of the probability that a ranking classifier puts a randomly drawn pair of positive and negative examples in the correct order. 
To reiterate, how we get a ranking classifier from a model depends entirely on the model. We need to figure that out for each model separately. So let's look at one more example, the tree classifier that we saw in the first lecture. Again, we'll discuss the actual algorithm for training decision trees later. For now, we'll just look at a given tree and see how we can work that into a ranking classifier so that we can determine its ROC curve and its area under the curve value. The decision tree is an example of a partitioning classifier. It splits the feature space into partitions, and each partition, also known as a segment, it assigns a class. And all instances in the segment get the same class. In this example, we have an instance space that has been split into four segments by a decision tree. We first rank the segments, and we do that by the proportion of positive points. The more positive points a segment has, the more likely we are to think that all points in that segment are positive. We then put all points that are in the same segment on the same level in the ranking. So here we don't have a full ordering of the instances, we have a partial ordering. For some instances we indicate that we think they are equally likely to be positive. So in this example, the classifier thinks that B is more negative than A, but it thinks that A and C are equally negative. This means that when we draw the coverage matrix, for some pairs in our data set, like Y and G, the classifier ranks them as the same. We color these as orange, and we generally count it as half a ranking error. For large data sets, these regions will not contribute much to the total area under the curve. Some important points to note. The confusion matrix and all matrix derived from it are metrics from a single classifier, and the AUC is essentially a metric for a collection of classifiers usually derived from a ranking classifier with a set of thresholds. How to turn a classifier into a ranking classifier depends entirely on what classifier you're faced with. For linear classifiers, we take the distance to the decision boundary, and for tree classifiers, we sort by class proportion in each, seg each segment. And the AUC is a good metric to use if we don't know the relative importance of the classes or if the classes are unbalanced. Note that we can do the same thing that we did in the ROC space in the precision recall space. So instead of ROC curves, we get precision recall curves. And as you can see in this tweet, in many settings, the PR curve can be much more informative, especially when you're plotting the curves to compare classifiers. Practically, it's little effort to just plot both and judge which one is the more informative. ROC does have the benefit of an intuitive interpretation for the AUC, the probability of ordering a random pair the right way around. And that's something I haven't yet found for the PR area under the curve. Of course, once you've picked a classifier that gives you a good ROC or a good PR curve, you may still need to choose which threshold to set when you use the classifier in production. One thing you can do is to simply show the user the ROC or PR curve and let them choose, but that can be difficult to do and to interpret accurately. Another thing you can do is to estimate the cost of misclassification, factor it into the loss function, and then minimize the expected cost. Let's recap what we've learned so far. It's important to split your data not just into a training and test set, but into a training validation and a test set so that you can, so that you can freely optimize your hyperparameters without fear of multiple testing. Accuracy is a great metric, very easy to interpret, but not when you have class imbalance or cost imbalance. If you do have one of these, make sure to look at your confusion matrix and to look at curves in your precision and recall space. These are not single numbers, but to be fair, when you deal with class imbalance and cost imbalance, it's best not to focus too much on single numbers and to look at multidimensional ways of representing the performance of your classifier. If you do ultimately need a single number, try using the area under the curve metric in the ROC space or in the precision recall space. In the next video, we'll return to the question of social impact and we'll see the importance in addition to accurately measuring the performance of your model, of accurately interpreting the performance of your model.